OK, now continuing here, I'm going to go into a little more detail talking about how. We use our Imagine software to address exactly what Brian's talking about, this aquifer monitoring, and, and he and I have worked together on this for a decade, so there, there's some synergies here. OK, if you. Order a service request from our partner Planet Tech. As I discussed previously, you would be given a data set at the end of the analysis. It'd be a shapefile data set which you could take into your own GIS if you want to analyze it there, or you can go to our online tools. It's called the Redicus site. That's the name of this service. And you would have an online in the cloud access to software and your data set if you wanted to analyze it here. So this is kind of a, a blow up of your controls over here. And you would start with logging in. I'm logged in as Hexagon Geospatial. Once I was logged into my account, I would be able to select my areas. These are all the various areas where I've worked on projects, but here's this Arizona McMullen site Brian was just talking about. So I would say I want to work on that site, and then this data would appear. Now, as I've talked about, every one of these points is some sort of a persistent permanent scatterer that's given me a time series analysis of that particular point. This is all color coded, so we've got everything from 17 centimeters of subsidence to 17 centimeters of inflation. Well, since we're talking about a subsidence feature, aquifer pumping, we're seeing mostly everything is in this reds, yellows, except you know we've got our stable points. Over here, we've got a whole series of filters I'm going to talk about that you can use to refine your data and look at it closer. I'm not going to talk a whole lot about the satellites right now. Sentinel is nice because that data is free, so the overall cost of your project is lower, but it's a coarse spatial resolution. If you're monitoring something like a you know, nuclear power plant, hydroelectric dam, you may want to spend the extra money for the higher resolution satellites and get higher resolution data. We also can have ascending or descending orbits. That really sort of means is the satellite looking to the east or is the satellite looking to the west? And depending on the, the terrain, the location of your feature, you may want to select one or the other of these as, at a, as a preferential view of your, your area. But I'm not going to go into those anymore. So, but taking a, a closer look at these filters that you have available to analyze your data. Everything is up here in the corner. One important point is every single persistent scatter here has a latitude and longitude associated with it. So this is all very precisely geo-referenced substance information. So you can go out here with a GPS and go to exactly the points, the areas that you think are critical for you. And also, of course, we have the ability to zoom into our data and take a closer and closer look. Now this is the area Brian also just talked about, this McMullen area. We, here's the city of Wendon that's slowly subsiding. And you can see we've got a lot of points out here, a lot of subsiding points over in here, but also note that in these areas where there's a lot of agriculture, we don't have a lot of information. That's because if you're plowing fields, harvesting crops, crops are growing, things are not persistent, things are changing. So we can't get persistent scatterer information in areas that are not persistently stable. So we unfortunately don't have information in some of these areas. Nevertheless, we can we can zoom in and take a closer look at our scene. And if, if you look at some at the structure of the of some of these red deep subsidence features, you remember on that black and white I showed you a long time ago when I did it with just two images, even with all that atmospheric noise and dim errors, I still had dark features that were showing the same subsidence. And as I've mentioned, we used to say, well, we'll model a subsidence feature as a as a, as a bowl. What else can you do when all you have is a GPS? But as you can see, this subsidence feature is not a bowl. And in fact, the subsidence feature, the structure of this subsidence feature is telling us something about the underlying bedrock where this subsidence is taking place. So we are seeing information about subsurface structure reflected in the surface subsidence feature. Interesting data sets. 
OK, one thing we can do is we can say I want to just look at last year. That may be the most important thing to me, or I can look at my whole global data set. And you can see there's not a lot of change because this area is kind of doing the same thing year after year. So let's just stick with global. The next thing, right, we want to look at is the velocity. Millimeters per year. How many millimeters per year is each one of these points moving? And as you can see, we don't have any inflation going on here. So these positive numbers are kind of irrelevant to us. So we can say, OK, let's go from zero to, you know, a, a 20 millimeter subsidence. All color coded again. We've got all these stable green areas that that's maybe not interesting to us. Let's refine our data set. Let's say we only want areas that are subsiding two or more centimeters. All right, so we can get rid of all that green. So we've got some yellow points out here. Maybe they're subsiding. Maybe that's our error bar. Maybe plus or minus two millimeters is our error bar. Not important, but still our, our focal point is here. We've got our, our, our intense subsidence well mapped. We can refine it further. Let's say we only want things that are subsiding more than four, right? Again. Or here we've gone all the way down to six. So we can really focus in on the points that are of interest to us. OK, so let's leave this at six and start looking at our acceleration. Where is this getting really bad really fast? You know, I can move this up acceleration to 25. Refines my points. I can move this up to 50. Now these are the points that are really seriously subsiding and really doing it fast. So th th this could be a very cr critical area to look at. Maybe this out here would be a critical area to look at. Massaging the data or refining our data like that helps us zoom in on the, the features of interest. OK, the other thing we can play with is the coherence. We've refined our velocity, refined our acceleration. The coherence is a measure of how stable was each one of these points over this time frame. You know, as a default, we set it at 50 50 percent normalized. We say, OK, we, we just want to take the the best 50 percent of the points. But or we can say, OK, let's let's move this up to 50 and take only these points. Right or even up to 60. So these are the points that were only the very best, the most consistent time after time after time after time. So we would probably be safe assuming that these data points are really good, precise data. So we can slowly hone, hone in on what, what's the highest quality data, but 50% is probably pretty good. So I would now looking at my data, I've refined it a little bit by playing with my sliders here, and you can see this is all real time. So you can refine this data very quickly, back and forth, play with it till you get what you want. But then you say, OK, now here's an area, and of course here's wind in that town that's going down, and we can see there's a lot of activity. So we let's dig down deeper into that. Let's zoom into that more. OK, here's Wendon. Here's our subsidence information. Each one of these points is our persistent scatterer. Red's our biggest scatterers. Let's zoom in a little bit deeper. Right, we can start seeing we've, we, we've got a map here, but now we can select these points. So I'm saying, OK, tell me about that point. That point has this graph associated with it. Every one of these points is one of these images taken in time from 2015 to 2019. So I can see what's happening here with time. I can, you know, I can, I can click this box here and say, OK, just show me a re regression line. Sorry, wrong way. Uh, so all I'm doing is just sticking a regression line in here just to give me a, a, a straight line instead of the erraticness that you know the real world has. The other thing I have down here is my is a timeline. So I'm looking now from March of 2015 all the way to January of 2019. But I can move this little slider here over to here and say, OK, I just want to look at November to January 2016 to 2019. So just by moving this little slider, I can I can zoom in on different time periods that I might want to take a look at. Now I would mention one little box over here is we also have the ability to import and plot rainfall data. As Brian mentioned, a lot of times these changes correlate with rainfall. Uh, 
you know, uh, mudslides, landslides, that, that a lot of times correlates with rainfall. So if you have the rainfall data, you could actually plot that at the same time and look for correlations between rainfall and your subsidence feature. So th these graphs, you can play around with them a lot. OK, now here's another point we're looking at down here, but you can see when I click that one, I get three graphs. That's because there's three points that are so close together that at this scale, they plot as one point. So when I click this one, I get three points actually, and I got my three graphs here. And I can play with them as I just showed you. I can change my time frame, et cetera, et cetera. But also I can keep zooming into my data. OK, now zoomed in one notch deeper. And now things will start, you know, now it's not three points anymore. It's, it, now, now it's two points. This one's two points, but this is now one separate point. So I click this one. It's still two points, but I've got my graphs. I have my information. I can look at it. Or I can zoom in one notch deeper. And it finally separates those two persistent scatterers that are close together. And I can pick either one I want. I get my time series plot. I can make my regression line. I can run a noise filter. I can look at my rain plot. I can change my time frame. So with this tool, you have a totally interactive ability with your data set. You can inquire deeply. You can precisely study what's happened at this point. You know the latitude and longitude. You know what happened in time. You can correlate things with, say, mining activity, rainfall, anything that you may have ancillary data that correlates with what is happening with this subsidence feature. 